Hey there, welcome to Table to Stage. I'm Jordan Worma, and this is my podcast, my continuing mission to explore creativity through the stories and experiences of creators in my home state of Connecticut and throughout the larger creative world. Now, today's creator is Maestro Doris Lang Kozlov. She is the artistic director of Opera Connecticut, the director of Hart School's Opera Theater and Vocal Studies programs, and the principal guest conductor of the Miami Lyric Opera. Now, if you're like me, you're going into this with little to no idea of what opera really is. Uh, it's always seemed rather foreign and inaccessible to me. Uh, so I hope you're prepared to have that bubble burst because we are about to get schooled. So get hydrated and warm up that diaphragm because here is my conversation with Maestro Doris Lang Cosmo. You're originally from New York. Yes, did probably you, so. <laughs> <laughs> as most New Yorkers are, I, I find. Um, did you grow up there, or did you move, did you move out of New York early no, on? I, I was uh, born in the center of the universe, which is a place called Brooklyn, New York, and um, spent my childhood and my life up until the time I left for graduate school living in and oh, around wow. New York City. Okay. Mm -hmm. what, was, uh, what was it like for you growing up in New York um, as far as your... your creativity and your intro to, to, to music and the arts, what was that first experience like for you? Well, first of all, um, it was without limits. Part of that was the fact that I grew up in a musical household. My mother uh -huh. was a music teacher. She became the president of the New York State Music Teachers Association. She taught both voice and piano. And so I just presumed that everybody in the world studied music and right. everybody had at least one piano in their house, which turned out in real life not to be true. Right. But but I believed that to be true. And I was able to, um, I was accepted at Juilliard Prep when I was seven and a half years old and moved my, my piano. Oh, I had been playing the piano since three or something like oh, that. Wow. Don't really remember, but something like that. So being in New York is a kind of a privileged thing in terms of the arts because everything is at your fingertips sure. if you're directed anywhere near to it. So um, I, my, that formal part of my music education started very young and continued throughout my life and I was a product of the New York City public schools and took my music ed my music programs at Juilliard as a young person until wow. I went to college. So how long were you at Juilliard then? Well I from the age of about seven or so through the time I went to high school. Oh wow so your entire grammar school yep. everything was yep. all through. Juilliard prep for. That's amazing. It's piano, a great opportunity. ear training, theory, all the all the basics of yeah. music training. Wow, so so you got everything, and now most of those public schools give none of them. <laughs> yeah, although public schools at the time that I was in school did have music programs, yeah. much more than there is now. As I think most of us know, the public funding has been de uh, decreased greatly in terms yeah. of music and art education. Uh, it's a problem because... Um, I think music educates us. Oh, yes. Not just because you don't learn the music, but right. by learning music, learning how to read music, you learn a lot of skills. Just performing music, I, I, th I, get, sure. I think it enhances everything that we do. Yeah, I mean, having a little bit of performance can maybe help later on with public speaking, engaging with your audience, and, exactly and right. every, every theater of life. <laughs> the only way to learn how to perform anything is to perform. Sure. You can't leave it in the studio. That's not performing. Right. And it's true that when you're in school, whether you're in elementary school or in high school, and you get up to perform in um, any musical, everybody does Annie, anything like that, you have learned how to perform. And yes, it will inform you when you need to get up and address maybe a corporate boardroom later right. in life. Yeah. No question. So when you, when you got through to high school and you decided you're going to go to college, mm -hmm. did you know early that you were going to pursue, pursue music in your secondary education, or was that something that was sort of a struggle to, de to make that decision? I think I was programmed from yeah. an early <laughs> age to believe that I was going to do that. Yeah. Um, I had an older sister, and she and I formed a duo piano team, and we were concertizing around the country from the time we were okay. 10 years old. So, wow. Yeah, it was very much part of the fabric of my life. Yeah. It, none of it was a surprise to me. So what was the what was the college experience like for you studying something that you've been doing 
it was easy. Your whole life. The answer, yeah. And the honest answer, it was easy. In fact, my professors would say, well, if you don't get 100 on your theory test, we, we, we want to know why, because everybody knew that we had had, my sister and I both had had the uh, privilege of the Juilliard pre-education before we ever went to college. Yeah. So, I mean, you, if you spent time performing and touring and, and doing all these things before getting your formal certificate <laughs> from the school, mm-hmm. I imagine you must have been a little bit frustrated at during college. Uh, what happened was, I, I, in terms of things like playing the piano and doing the ear training theory and the, the kinds of things that I've been doing forever, I, it just was easy. So yeah. what happened is I began exploring other things in yeah. music, which was really terrific. What Singing were some of those in things? small renaissance ensembles, things oh, of that kind of okay. things, things that didn't come that easily. Yeah. So um, I did some modeling when I was in college just for fun because huh. I was offered the opportunity, so I did that. I also decided to add a pre-med major when I was in college <laughs> because because I, I wanted to take organic chemistry and sure. something. So wow. I... I think as most people in college, having uh, not just electives, but things that will take you outside of your comfort zone. I was also extremely involved in sp- in sp- certain sports in terms of, well, playing tennis, but also in terms of just becoming um, a, a lifelong devotee of the masterful game of baseball uh-huh. um, at the professional level and watch it and going to just tons and tons of baseball games. So I, I took on other things that okay. were of interest to me. Based on your growing up, I'm guessing, Yankee fan? Yankees, Mets. Both. Oh, m- both. both. both yes. Okay. All right. NY, NY. Just I am fill a, it in. I'm yes. a big Mets fan, yeah. as other listeners but of the show it could, probably it know. It could be this year. <laughs> could be. It this could, could be the be year. It could be this year. They're I mean, off just, to a promising but, start. But, but you know what? You've got it. You've got it. Uh, in the opera of um, Wozzeck, the character said, langsam Wozzeck, langsam. Take it slow. Yes. Because we're just a well, weekend. It's, it's been 32 years. It's pretty slow. <laughs> yes. Uh, so what was well? Yes. Yeah. So after you finished college, and you, I mean you've been performing, you've been you've been studying your whole life for this stuff. When you f- first get the post collegiate career started, what was the first move for you after completing your first degree? Well, since I was a double major, both in music and pre med, I had to decide which way I was going to go. Yeah. And I kind of thought I was going to go to med school, and then. I just said, no, I think I'm going to – I was really a, primarily a pianist at that point in time. Okay. And so I said, you know, there's a really great piano teacher at Boston University. His name was Leon Tamarkin. And what – I'm just going to throw – just see what happens. And there was also Georgi Shandor at University of Michigan, two fantastic pianists. I said, I'm just going to throw in an application to those two schools, which I was immediately accepted at both. I was a very, very good student. as a Phi Beta Kappa student and – Academically, no problem with anything. And then I didn't know where to go. Yeah. And so uh, being from New York, I really kind of was an East Coast person. And I took the uh, probably the path of least resistant and went up to Boston. <laughs> and, and I actually had to perform uh, as audition behind an audition screen, which is the way people do oh. perform. Because they should not know your gender. Right. They should not know, know your ethnicity. They should just know how you either sing or play. Sure. And this is how auditions are gun, done. And um, it went really well. Later on, I was allowed to look at my audition sheet, and it said it said it was something very interesting that it wrote that this person that they did not know, male, female, what I looked like, what anything, they wrote down Slavic, which is interesting because huh. my heritage is half Russian and half Hungarian. How would and they pick that up? The way out I from played the piano. Playing. I'm just telling you what happened. That's fascinating. That's true. Where, where, did you ever get any indication of how they were able to pick I up did. on that? I just was allowed to look. I oh wow! To, yeah. that, that I feel like there's a story. For, if I could track those I, those folks down, <laughs> but they were right. They were right. That's amazing. And so I actually thought because my sister had gone on into composition, and I was now half of a duo piano team that I would just continue my studies and become a concert pianist, mm-hmm. which is where I was heading. That's that's what I thought when I entered graduate school, because I got a great fellowship at BU, and I, I found a great teacher, and that's, wh- and that's what I started off doing. Um, one of the things that I was assigned as part of my fellowship to play for singers in different teacher studios, and I thought, I like this. Mm-hmm. I like the words part of music. 
Because mm. as a pianist and instrumentalist, the words, is, it's no words, it's sure. just music. And so um, I was fascinated, and I also was assigned to a professor who was the conductor of the opera to be his assistant. Oh, okay. And I'm finding a love working with singers, and I said, I think I'm going to learn the, all the repertoire, and I'll be a singer's pianist and collaborate that way. And I was assigned to my professor, um, and he, we were doing the magic flute. At, that was the big production. Mm -hmm. And I was his assistant. And I just said, I love this thing. I'm going to learn it, just what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to be his assistant. I had my score. Every, I was at every rehearsal with him. The day before the Magic Flute opened, I got a call in my little teeny tiny apartment in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They told me that our professor had just been taken to the hospital and oh, could I no. conduct the Magic Flute the next day. And I said, yes. Oh, man. I probably should have said no, but I said <laughs> yes. And as I was conducting that performance, I knew that that's what I would do for the rest was, of my life. Was this your first experience in... Conducting in the opera? opera? First experience conducting opera. Right? I had studied conducting. As a music major, you study conducting. Sure. But that was the first thing I ever did, conducting wow. opera. Just being... And, and I you, didn't even know enough to be you know, nervous about it. I was just excited <laughs> about it. But as it was happening, I knew what I would do for the rest of my life. Wow. That's incredible. And true, strangely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so with the first experience conducting an opera... <clears throat> How did that change how you were looking at the next steps in your career path? Well, once I was fell in love with that job, I had to figure out what to do uh -huh. to get more opportunities. And how, how does one do that? And so um, I took it upon myself to really um, do a lot of language study because mm. you really... If you're going to do opera, you pretty much need to know Italian. I mean, not just <laughs> fake Italian, but right. real Italian, because so much of the repertoire is in Italian, unless you're somebody who's going to be immersed in German opera. That's another possibility. Okay. But I knew pretty much that that wasn't where I was going. So I did a lot of, I took a lot of language study, then Italian first. Um, I had studied German as an undergraduate in college. Ah, okay. And then I, then I took French also. I just, and then ultimately Russian. Oh, so you got a basis in all the, the major language you groups have then. To, you have to. You have to. <laughs> yeah. Because one of the things in, which is totally different, first of all, there's one of the things about opera is that it's a production. It's not just the music. Mm -hmm. There's the sets and the costumes and the lighting and the coordination between the pit and the stage. It's a total, there are so many things to learn. Right. And... I just spent the next several years of my life learning. I finished my degree as a major, and then I said, well, then I got a job t as a music teacher, uh -huh. and then I went to get married, and my, few, my husband was in law school in Washington, D.C., so I moved down there, and I just got myself a job at the Washington Opera and oh, the Wolf Trap. It's not a little. And, well, <laughs> I, said, I mean, I figured I'd do anything they needed yeah. because I could play the piano like crazy. That's a great entree into positions. And then I became... Uh, the chorus master and the coach at Washington Opera. And wow. From there, come if you work hard, <laughs> you just find your way. That's incredible. So, I mean, you touched on, on the, the, the language thing a little bit, and that seems like a good place to transition to the, the, the form and structure of opera. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not familiar with very much opera. I Nor think, are most people. I think that the the... The vocalization of opera singers that I've heard is something that is amazing to me, quite quite frankly, and it's a little intimidating. <laughs> um, With good reason. Yeah, it, but how? Okay, so if if you were composing an opera, what are what are the the main characteristics that make your piece an opera? Okay, so as a non composer, <laughs> yes, but I can still answer your question. Um, Obviously, you're gonna, the first thing you're going to have is a libretto, mm -hmm. which is the Italian word for it. It means little book, but it's the words to the opera. Mm -hmm. They come from somewhere. Either they're composed, free, free form composed, or you've taken a play or a book or a novella and enlarged it to tell a story. Yeah. So first comes the words. Okay. That's the first thing. Then after that, different composers compose in different ways. Um, here at the Hart School, which is where we're doing this um, podcast today, 
Um, the, we, had, we had a composer come in in January. Her name is Lori Leitman. She's a very um, important American composer, and she writes almost only vocal music. Mm. And she did a master class here. We did one of her operas here. She also said that she always does the melody first as soon as she sees the words. Oh, okay. it's the mel- and then she adds the orchestral music after that. But different composers, some of them compose vertically. As they're writing the tune, they're filling in all the orchestration and harmony. Sure. Um, so it's different by different composer. But what is it when, when you have the libretto, you have the, all the, the pieces together, what makes it an opera and not a musical play? That's a, first of all, there, I'm sorry to tell you <laughs> that there is no one answer. Okay. One of the things is well, that... Well, that, that makes it an interesting it, answer. It, it, it does indeed. For example... Most, some, most operas do have no speaking in them. But okay. some operas, like the Magic Flute, for example, which is a very fam- op- famous opera, is actually not an opera. Hmm. It's called a Zingspiel because there's spoken dialogue and s- sung music. That's probably why it's called an opera then, <laughs> because but it's called a Zingspiel. <laughs> Zingspiel, which means we sing and we speak. Okay. But, but it's technically... That's German, right? But it's technically... Well, it was written in, in German. Yeah. Die Zauberflöte is the name in German. Yes. So... so it's technically not an opera, huh. and yet it's one of the most famous operas. But most operas, there is no, for example, La Boheme, okay. maybe the most perfect opera written. certainly one of my favorites. Um, there is not a sp- single spoken word in the entire opera, nor is there in most operas. Right. However, I always, because I ask this question all the, I ask the question that you just asked, mm-hmm. what makes something an opera and not just a mu- piece of musical theater? Um, so Les Mis, what is that? I've heard it called an operetta very often. Well, I don't know <laughs> what it is. I still don't know what it is. I think it's its own genre. Mm. Um, Porgy and Bess, which was an opera uh-huh. written by um, the Gershwins, mm-hmm. because George Gershwin wrote the words, and his brother Ira Gershwin, with Du Bois Hayward, wrote the lyrics for it. It was called an American folk opera. There is some speaking mm-hmm. in that, but there's a ton of singing. It's terribly difficult. Um, so I, I guess the answer is opera is singing with orchestra and storytelling. Although that makes Les Mis an opera. Right. Um, then there's the difference between opera and operetta is more about the subject matter. Because originally there was a difference between opera seria, which was the opera that was often about religious themes okay. or, king or royalty, and opera buffa, which is more about comic things, which often had um, some spoken dialogue in it. Okay. Uh, but the answer is... There is no answer. That's interesting. Uh, I've asked the question. I ask myself all the time, and I ask it in in seminars with students. What is opera? Yeah. Huh. Sorry. No, that's sorry that's about great. that. No I, I answer. Mean, I'm I'm filled with so many questions right now. Like, <laughs> so am I. Why? Why do we separate opera from more what we consider? traditional musical theater then? Okay. I'm, I love this question. I think most of it has to do with the following. Since opera was not an American invention, uh-huh. and musical theater was. Right. Although the Brits would say that it's British mm-hmm. with the Gilbert and Sullivan, which was a takeoff on grand opera. Right. And became its own brand of operetta. But a lot of it, this has to do with language. And what happens is, since most... Even now, even, we've had a lot of operas now written in English, mm-hmm. but the most of the body of opera has not been written in English. And so when it came to the United States, people tended to perform it over gesticulating because uh-huh. people didn't speak the language right. in which they were being told the story. Right. Uh, it's often said that there was baritone position number one, baritone position number two. One was for love, one was for killing someone. Uh-huh. These kind of exaggerated positions and ways of communicating. And I think that set up a barrier with people. In the huh. US. Okay. However, the barrier was overcome by the use of surtitles or supertitles. Mm-hmm. 
Because once we found out in opera that why shouldn't people be able to know what people were singing, we instituted surtitles or supertitles. Um, the woman who was responsible in New York for really making that happen was with the now defunct city opera. Her name is Sonia Friedman. And she created the titles, which at that time were done on slides and done in a slide carousel. Now we do everything through PowerPoint. So this, this is kind of similar to the way they used to do the, uh, the, the silent films Absolutely in theaters. Absolutely an excellent analogy. Yeah. Yes. And what happened, by the way, I'm very proud of one thing that I did, which was I was the first person in the state of Connecticut to ever institute the uh, use of supertitles. Uh huh. Which theater was this? This was in the Bushnell Theater with a now defunct organization called Connecticut Opera. Okay. Um, went out of business about 10 years ago. But it was a major regional opera company for which I worked. And I said, we just have to do it. Sure. And people said, no, we shouldn't do it. But we did it. Now we have found that American opera audiences, even when operas are in English, demand titles. Because the style of singing in some opera writing embraces the extreme tessitura or range mm -hmm. on both ends, very low yes. and very high. But when you sing very high above the staff, whether you're a tenor or a soprano, oftentimes the language and the words can get lost. Sure, it's very, very hard to enunciate. Actually, impossible <laughs> in some places. And so supertitles really cure that problem. Yeah. I, I, I could see knowing that the titles were going to be available to me, making that more accessible. Like I, I could, and even, never mind the language, it, whatever language it's in, because ultimately story is what drives people to any form, as far as I'm concerned, to any form of theater or art. There's a story being told by an artist or a singer or composer, and if I know I can follow the story, I'm going to be much more likely to sit and watch the story being told. It would be the only way, I, for example, if you're listening to something and you don't speak the language, they might as well just sing on law. <laughs> right. But, I mean, the other thing that is important to note, a difference, is that opera is an acoustic art form. Uh-huh. We don't use microphones. In the Metropolitan Opera, it seats almost 4,000 people. The trained voices can be heard over the orchestra because they know how to sing. Tra they're trained to sing diaphragmatically, and they are their own microphones. Okay, and that's very different from music theater. Yeah. Okay. So now I have to, I have to get on a little bit on that because okay. the the voice aspect of this is something like, like I said, it's intimidating to me. And I've been singing since I was about five years old, but was never trained in opera. It's always it's always been this this other thing on this this whole other world. I didn't realize that operas were not uh, amplified. Mm -hmm. So what is it about opera singing, technically, that makes it such a different form of vocalizing than, I don't want to talk about pop singing, but <laughs> musical theater or, or other more traditional um, or better known forms of voice? Okay, great question, and a basic question. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you can sing into a microphone and use no diaphragmatic breath whatsoever because the microphone will solve your problems in terms of amplification. But you have to use your air mm -hmm. to actually phonate when you sing as an opera singer or any classically trained singer. It could be oratorio as well. Mm -hmm. which are, or if you're a concert singer with an orchestra. There's a reason that you can hear these people over an orchestra, and it has to do with learning breathing and singing on the breath, sure. not just singing from your throat. Okay. Uh, is that a barrier to people who, when, they, when people begin singing, can that technical aspect of it be a barrier to people making it? further along in their training? Is there, is there a, a point where some people just can't get there? Or um, I, is, I, it, is it always something that can be, that can be learned? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your question, but before I do that, I can say this. Even with proper training, not everybody can be an opera singer. Of, of course. You have to be born with the right vocal equipment. Mm -hmm. And I always say to students, thank your parents, <laughs> because you can't learn to have a good voice. Right. 
you can learn how to sing properly. So the first part of the question is a backup step, which sure. is saying uh, you need the basic apparatus to at least on some level before you can make it good enough to perform an opera. Right. But in terms of age, you know, it depends on the voice type. Some voices mature much earlier than others. For example, there are probably about 10 different kinds of classifications of sopranos. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not. Uh, there are so and combinations, lirico spinto, coloratura, I mean dramatic. There are all these different kinds of soprano voices. Okay. If you are a light lyric soprano, your voice is going to mature before other voice types. So if you wait until you're 30 to take voice lessons, I think you're going to have a tough time. Okay. If you're a basso, your voice is going to even start to mature until you're 30. Oh, wow. So you could start studying later, and um, some people have. For, I mean, Is there like a blood test you can take to figure out? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think <laughs> figure so. Figure out which I, one you I are. I don't think so. <laughs> okay. And I would also say one of the hard things, because I do teach in university also and have to assign students to a voice teacher, I say finding the right voice teacher is kind of like buying a pair of shoes. Mm. It can look great in the store window, but you have to put them on to see if they fit. Sure. It's finding a voice teacher is the same. Because teachers use different methods. And some are very physiological mm -hmm. in their information. Some teach by analogy. Um, te people teach all different ways. And so um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's hard to find the right voice teacher, and finding the right method is also difficult. But I would say, but your question, for example, if you're a tenor, if you're a, a, a very leggero tenor, a light tenor, starting early is better. But if you're going to be a dramatic tenor, again, mm -hmm. you're not going to come into your own and start really getting in there until you're 28 or 30 years old. Right. Is there, is there generally any pattern to, let's say, somebody at a young age, starts singing, starts training. Is there an age where somebody's voice becomes, maybe you start out as, as you said, a light tenor, and as you get older, your voice changes? Absolutely. Can you, does, does your operatic training, th does that go away? No. Okay. In fact, you, so we, it, we use the, word, the German, and some things in Italian, we always use Italian phrase. In opera, we sometimes use Italian phrases, sometimes use German phrases. Mm -hmm. So the word Fach means like a category. Mm -hmm. the Fach, there's a Fachenbuch in German, which is where they list all the different categories of voices. And you can move from one to another by age. Um, uh -huh, for example, okay. there's a very famous um, Spanish tenor, tenor, Placido Domingo. Mm -hmm. He's one of the three tenors, sure. Pavarotti and Carreras. And he was, of course, a tenor for many, many years. And he's now moved down to being a baritone. Yes. Your voice tends to drop with age. That has happened to me. And it, hap <laughs> it happens to everyone. It happens to everyone. Yeah. So sometimes you may lose high notes, but you may gain low notes. Yes. I mean, I, I was a, a high tenor as a younger person. I am now more comfortable in a, in a high baritone tenor two-ish range. Right. <laughs> makes perfect sense. Some, it's hardest for people who are the high flyers. Like if you're a high C tenor, mm -hmm. um, and then one day there's no high C. Right. You do. Yeah, I don't have that anymore. <laughs> or I have an A. If, 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 if you're a high, well, I call them high Z sopranos, because sopranos can sing incredibly high, and then one day you're not. The role of the Queen of the Night in the Magic Flute is a perfect example, because um, the Queen of the Night has to sing multiple high Fs. That's a very, very, very high note. Uh -huh. And sopranos who can sing it can sing it any day of the week. Right. And then one day they can't. So you always have an understudy. <laughs> no, <but laughs> just I mean, in case it happens mid-show. One day mid -show. it's just yeah. gone. Wow. And for example... The but there's no way to predict something no, like that? I mean, you, you, you can kind of figure it out by age, but for example, the role of Tonio in The Daughter of the Regiment, which is one of Pavarotti's signature roles when he first came over. Okay. It, it had nine high C's in the aria. And when he left that piece and went on to sing lots of other great things, and he came back and he came back to the Met and he did the aria transposed down, but everybody heard it. Um. You can't. There are some pieces you can transpose and some you mm -hmm. can't. 
but a piece that's noted for a specific note. Yeah. If you can't sing it anymore, best not to right. sing it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. All true. Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, we touched on language a little bit. German, Italian. French. French. And opera has sort of spanned the globe in terms of its reach, but it's all it's very much, at least for me, and I think for most people not you know novicely aware of opera as an art form, it seems always to be associated with one of those languages. And I know we've already talked about it being written in English now, but the regionalization of the different forms of opera over the last few hundred years that the, the form's been around, is there, like if, if you're listening to an opera, is it clear to you that it's a German opera musically or a French piece, Italian piece, or something from China or Japan? Like, is there, is there a regional yeah. a component to these things? Uh, the answer is yes. Okay. In fact, it's interesting because in Germany for many, many years, um, most famously the home of the operas of Richard Wagner, mm. the ring cycle, you know, the flying Dutchman, things sure. of the sort. But for many, many years, all the opera companies, which were supported by the state, all opera was done in German in Germany. Okay. And I have heard some of those recordings of Italian operas in German. They don't work <laughs> very well. Okay. But there are some operas that are lighter operas. For example, La Fille du Regiment, which I referenced before, was done all the time in the vernacular. In Italy, it was always done in Italian. In okay. Spain, it was done in Spanish. In Germany, it's, so some operas, those of lighter um, themes often are done the vernacular, which is also true for operetta. Yes. Um, the great one of the great uh, operettas, Die Fledermaus, which actually means the bat, which is a, 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 a Johann Strauss operetta, mm-hmm. different from Richard Strauss, the the more ha- uh, hardcore German composer. <laughs> and but it's a it's a piece of fluff. It's a wonderful piece. It's funny. Mm-hmm. It always should be done in the vernacular because it has a lot of dialogue and a lot of jokes. Okay. So some operas move very well from language to language. Others do not. Okay. Before we use super titles in this country, uh, for example, when I was an assistant conductor at, an op- at Connecticut Opera, the defunct company in the state, we would do op- like a Bohem performance in Italian one night and English the next night. It wow. never... It, you had to have two different casts do it. Yeah. But it didn't really work. Florida Grand Opera used to do that too. Now with super titles, we go to the native language except with certain exceptions. For example, the great opera of Humperdinck, Hansel and Gretel, or Hansel and Gretel as mm-hmm. we say in English, we almost always do in English now because it works very well in English. Right. I've written a translation of that that's done all over the world. Oh, really? In English. Yeah, oh, done all wow. over the country, I should say. Now, how much of that... So the success of that being in, performed in English has to do with just the familiarity of the story. A lot. Yeah. A lot. Okay. Mm-hmm. As far as um, the musical structure of the opera, is there a difference between the, the musical elements of, say, a Japanese opera as opposed to a German or Italian opera? I mean, do they use the same instruments? Are they in the same modalities? How, how different are these different pieces? Well, in the traditional art forms in Japan and China, um, they were very different, but there is a definite tendency now for Western opera to have pervaded both of those mm. cultures. The structure of the Wagner operas is decidedly different from the structure of Italian operas, which often have arias that start and end. The Wagner operas are what we call through-composed. Okay. And they start at the beginning of an act, and things... Although there are arias embedded in them, there is no stopping. Right. And so there was a, they were more broad stroke kind of construction. Okay. In the instrumentation in traditional Chinese opera, yes, of course, it's different. Um, but again, in much of the East now, particularly Korea, mm-hmm. uh, Western opera has taken over and pervaded, and that's happening in China as well. What about... What about the, the, the art form of opera has kept it so alive through so many different cultures over the last through 400 years. Mm-hmm. Is, is there a, a sort of a through line that, that you've ever been able to identify that it's kept it as such a vibrant uh, piece of artistic um, expression? I think the last word you use is kind of the key to that. 
It's the fact that it taps into people's emotive centers. Yeah. Is there is something incredibly thrilling about somebody singing and tapping into emotions. This is more in the opera series or the grand opera. Yeah. And sometimes things go beyond words and it needs the combination of words and music to do it. Sure. I would say I believe that's true. Um, although a lot of the... Um, the uh, you know, Jake Hagee wrote an opera um, uh, about Moby Dick. Okay. Took the novel of Moby <laughs> Dick and he did it. And he it was something that was was galvanizing. I flew down to Washington to see it. I had two friends who were in the cast, too. Uh-huh. So sometimes you can take contemporary themes and make them important. But I do think it's the combination of emotion and tapping into people's feelings and everything else that made it. So the, the, the last thing I, I want to touch on, because we are at heart school right now. Yeah. So what sort of opera programs are, are you involved with here? And how is this program furthering the development of opera performers and the art form? First of all, thank you for the question. So I hold three positions simultaneously. Um, uh, in addition to being the director of vocal studies in the Hart Opera Theater, I'm also the director, uh, the artistic director of Opera Connecticut, which is a local professional company that produces traditional operas. And I also am the principal guest conductor of Miami Lyric Opera down in Miami, Florida. Oh, so, so a short commute. Yeah. <laughs> so at the Hart School here, we alternate between doing a very traditional opera. Last we, last year we did the operetta, The Merry Widow, something okay. very familiar. And this year we did a double bill of an American opera, Laurie Laitman's opera, which was specifically configured for our performance and Ravel's L'Enfant et les Sortilèges, written in French and performed in French. Okay. So we did quirky things one year and then traditional things. Next year we will, and then we just finished a montage of scenes from of Mozart from The Magic oh. Flute and Don Giovanni. Okay. So every year it's we do something to so that students can learn the different basic styles of opera. Sure. Uh, where do the students for this program come from? Wow. Like they can't possibly all be no, Connecticut born. In, in fact, almost none are. Okay. Well, but we have a few. Uh, we, it's like the United Nations here. <laughs> students from from Mexico. We have lots of students from China. I went on a recruiting trip there a year and a half ago. Um, our dean is leaving next week to go on another recruiting trip to wow. China. We have students from Korea. We have students from Australia, Canada. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Everywhere. That's wonderful. It is like the United Nations here. Yeah. And if you see one of our productions, every ethnicity, every race, every everything is represented. We All opera casting now is done race and, race and ethnicity blind. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I appreciate it. It's been my great pleasure. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Once again, a big thank you to Maestro Doris Lang Kozlov for taking the time out of her busy schedule to speak with me. Uh, You can learn more about the Hart School at the University of Hartford by visiting hartford.edu slash Hart. That's H-A-R-T-T. And for more info on Opera Connecticut, visit operaconnecticut.org. Now, if you're enjoying the show, I hope you'll take a moment to leave a rating or a review on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen. Um, and even take a visit to patreon.com slash table to stage to find out how you can support the show a little bit more directly. Now, we're fast approaching the first ever table to stage live in Hartford on May 22nd, so be sure to reserve your tickets in advance by visiting table to stage pod.com slash live. Now, the show is happening at CT Comedy Theater in Hartford and includes performances by comedian Rob Santos, singer-songwriter Abby Auden, and drag queen duo Summer Orlando and Barbara Jones Street Sand, plus games and audience participation. Now, I hope to see you all there. That's it for now. Until next time, keep creating.